this is incredibly exciting. I'm usually in a tiny podcast studio, uh, and it is really thrilling to do these live events and sort of get to be in the same room as the people who listen to the podcast. Uh, as Alan so sweetly announced that um, the podcast is doing really well, but I'm always thrilled to have new subscribers. So it's called Little Known Facts Podcast, and you can find it everywhere that podcasts are. I just want to take a minute to thank all of you for being here and to thank Google for being the most generous hosts. Uh, we had an incredible lunch today. We'll be back for dinner. We hope we will see you all there. Um, the reason I am so thrilled to kick off this live podcast event at Google uh, is because the cast of Be More Chill, the show of Be More Chill, is truly one of my most favorite things on the planet. And after today, it will certainly be yours. Um, we're going to have a conversation with them once they finish singing for us. And you'll get to see why I have fallen so deeply in love with this talented crew, not just because they are the most magnificent artists, but because they are the most magnificent people. So we're going to start off. I'm going to welcome Joe Iconis, who wrote uh, the musical Be More Chill. He's the lyricist and the book writer. And he's going to go to the piano and welcome some of the cast members and tell you a little bit about the songs that they're going to be singing. Um, and then you guys will have a chance for a little Q&A later. Anyway, thank you for spending time with us today. And welcome to Be More Chill. Hi, gang. Hello, everyone. Um, yeah, as Alana said, we're so excited to be, uh, to be hanging with you all. Uh, on 15th Street and beyond today. Um, so Be More Chill, for those who don't know, is this musical that's about, uh, it's about a lot of things. Uh, it's about um, sort of heavy issues, right? So it's about anxiety and depression and our relationship with technology. Uh, but it's uh, sort of disguised as a teen sci-fi comedy. Uh, and the, the actual story is, is about this kid named Jeremy. He's this really like nothing special kid. Uh, one might call him a nerd, uh, but he's not even full-blown nerd. He's kind of neither here nor there. There's nothing remarkable about this kid. And he finds out that there's this thing called a squip. And what a squip is, is it's a supercomputer inside of a pill. And all people who are popular in this world, they've all taken squips, right? So the, the, they take this this pill the supercomputer implants in their brain and then this voice tells them how to behave and so Jeremy finds out oh this is a thing that people do I should take a squip and the the show is kind of his uh, his journey uh, throughout that and it's um, you know it's really inspired by like like um, like John Hughes 1980s sort of you know teen comedies like uh, like uh, 16 candles and pretty in pink and also John Carpenter 1980s horror movies uh, sort of a mashup of those two things and so the show is populated by these young people who uh, who kind of self-identify as misfits. You know, there are these people who feel like they don't quite fit in. And uh, you're going to meet some of them right now. And so the first character you're going to meet is our leading lady, uh, Christine Canigula, who's played by the incredible Stephanie Hsu. <laughs> Stephanie, do you want to tell our friends a little bit about Christine? Oh, okay. Sup, Google. Um, so Christine Canigula is, uh, she is what I like to call a, a rare bird. Um, she's a total weirdo, and she um, is our is our love interest. She is the she's the mm -hmm. honey, the apple of Jeremy <laughs> Here's Eye, and um, she is a diehard uh, theater nerd. Um, and that is sort of her guiding light as and philosophy of how life and and change and feminism work. Um, I feel like that's a pretty. That was that was a great setup. Thank you so much. We're all so ready Thank for this song. Thank you so much. <laughs> this is sort of her one of the first songs that she sings that uh, you know, so you get to know her a little bit. <clears throat> I love play rehearsal because it's the best because it is fun I love play rehearsal and I get depressed as soon as it's done but not depressed as in like kill yourself depressed no I'm not into self-harm dude I swear here check my arm see just use the word to emphasize a point. Show the passion that I've got. I am passionate a lot. 
I have my gigantic feelings, ran and frantic feelings about most everything. Like gun control, like spring. Like if I'm living up to all I'm meant to be. I also have a touch of ADD. Where was I? I love play rehearsal Cause you are equipped with directions and text Life is easy in rehearsal You follow a script so you know what comes next Anywho, the point that I'm getting to is sometimes life can't work out in the way It works out in the play like the only time I get to be the center of attention Is when I'm Juliet or Blanche Dubois And can I mention that was really one of my best roles? <laughs> it made me feel like um, there just aren't strong roles for women in the theater these days Particularly high school theater Do you find that? Because I totally find that and no matter how hard I try, yeah, it's impossible to narrow down the many reasons why I, 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 I love play rehearsal. I happiness cry as soon as it starts. It's just so universal getting to try playing so many parts. Most humans do one thing for all. The thought of that gives me hives I have so many interests I want to pursue And why am I telling this to you? Guess there's a part of me that wants to <laughs> There's also a part of me that wants to do this I thought that was gonna come out louder, but then it came out quieter. <laughs> um, you guys have a really great cafeteria. <laughs> Back to play rehearsal. My brain is like bzzz. My heart is like wow. Because we're here at play rehearsal and it's starting. We're starting. Stephanie Shear. The incredible Stephanie Shu. Uh, so this next tune is a song that's sung by uh, our, uh, our leading man, Jeremy, and uh, his best friend, Michael. And um, in this song, these two guys are, uh, they're sort of talking about you know, a, lot of, a lot of these heavy life issues that I was speaking of before. Uh, Jeremy has just found out that there's this thing called a squip. He's debating whether, he, not, not, whether or not he wants to get it. Uh, and Michael is, is essentially saying, why, why do you want to change who you are? Just be cool with who you are. And they're having this very, very, very uh, intense conversation while playing a video game. And here to sing the song uh, is Mr. Will Rowland and Mr. George Salazar. <clears throat> hey, gents. Hi, Joe. So Hi, Will, Joe. Will plays Jeremy. I play Jeremy. And, and George plays Michael. I play Michael. And, uh, and we, we are best friends in the show. Um, and I think it's important to know that during this song, uh, these two best friends... Uh, are playing video games. Yeah. Is that important to know? Yeah, of course, yeah. It's too late, they know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Apocalypse of the Dam. Level nine. The Cafetorium. Find the bad guy, push him aside. Then move on forward with your friend at your side. It's a two-player game, so when they make an attack, you know you got a brother gonna have you back. Then you stay on track, and I'll remain on course. And if they give you a smack, you got you used your force. And if you leave your brother behind, it's lame. Because it's an effed up world, but it's a two-player game. Hey. are cooler than a vintage cassette it's just that no one else but me thinks that yet you're just a nothing in this high school scheme but it's no big cause you and i are a team we like out of print 
games, retro skates, got a Pac-Man tattoo. Nobody here appreciates, but soon we'll be together where they do. Cause guys like us are cool in college, cool in college, this I know. Guys like us are cool in college, we rule in college, listen bro. High school is hell, but we navigate it well, cause what we do is we make it a two player game. Zombie, watch out. Uh, uh. As losers, we have fought together for years. Both Nintendo zombies and our popular peers. Now we're stuck on a level, and I want to move on. Just wait two years, where upon you'll realize guys like us are cool in college. Cool in college won't be lame. Dude, I know I get it. Guys like us are cool. In college, but we're not in college. All the same. High school is whack, but we have each other's back. It's me and you. We made it a two player game. Ha! Oh. Zombie! Blood! Claws! Pause. You know that you are my favorite person. That doesn't mean that I can't still dream. Is it really true? I'm your favorite person. Yes, we're <laughs> never not going to be a team. High school is shit. And you gotta help me conquer it. It's just what we do. We make it a two-player game. Find the bad guy, push him aside. Then move on forward with your friend at your side. It's a two-player game, so when they make an attack, you know you got a brother, gotta have your back. Then you stay on track, and I'll remain on course. And if they give you a smack, you got you use your force. And if you leave your brother behind, it's lame. Cause it's an effed up world, but it's a two-player game. Hey! Um, Stephanie's gonna join us up here. Joe, come sit with us. Don't you wanna be friends with these yeah. people? Like, don't you immediately just wanna spend all your time with Jeremy and Michael and Christine? I guess the thing that is really extraordinary that I just wanna briefly tell you guys about, and then these beautiful people can fill it in. The path to Broadway for Be More Chill was extremely um, new, right? It kind of has broken all the rules in terms of why things become part of the Broadway community. And this show became a Broadway beloved show because the internet, and you guys work Google, so maybe you've heard of the yeah. internet, and things like Google, and just clicks and likes. Everyone early on found the cast recording from this show that was done at a regional theater. And there was a moment where they thought it wasn't going to get to continue. And the brilliant Ghostlight Records came up with the idea, like, let's record this wonderful musical in this teeny theater in New Jersey. And somehow the megaphone that is now ha the internet, and I'm going to tell one person and they're going to tell one person, young people found this cast recording and they went insane to the tune of like 300 million downloads at this point. Is that an inaccurate number? 
Uh, 320, but oh. yes. <laughs> And at 12.24 p.m. today, 322 million. <laughs> exactly, um, yeah. So this is just an extraordinary thing, and it's groundbreaking, and it's sort of a show that is on Broadway because we demanded that it be there. So that alone is just the most beautiful part of this story. The reason I do my podcast is that I just believe in community first and foremost. That is all I care about, at the, at, at the root of who I am. And this show... And Joe Iconis, who's sort of the leader of this community of Be More Chill, is so beautiful because not only is it a show about, like, all of us, and we can find ourselves reflected in every single character that you've written in the show, whether you're 35 uh, or, or 17. Which of those are, am I? <laughs> 17. But like, it is a group of people who are getting to do their play together on Broadway. And you feel that every night. And that friendship is true. And these relationships are all true. So that is all I will say. I know you don't want to hear any more from me. But I just have to say out loud that I'm in awe and in love with not just the show, but the people who make this show. And that is why it's so special. We love you too. We love you. Thank you. Wait, I, can I just say that yeah. this is this is? I just feel like I really want to share this because I've I've never thought of this before. But I don't know if y'all remember the Gray album, which was like Jay Z and the Beatles mashup. It was like very underground and like really like Napster. <laughs> It was like very Napster and people were be Napster and people were like making CDs of it and passing it around. And so I feel like for the first time I've likened that in just hearing what you were saying, likened that to the original recording of this show, which is that for it wasn't the Grey album, but it was the Be More Chill um, original recording where all these people were just, oh, my God, you got to hear this. You got to hear this. And they kind of resurrected it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and it's something and the way that we got here, you know, I've talked a lot about it and it's something that it could only have happened in 2018, 2000, 2019 um, in the way that it happened because of social media. But the actual kernel of it is the most sort of old school thing. The whole sort of sensation aspect of Be More Chill happened because people just liked these songs. You know, it was like word of mouth. It was people just telling other people, you know, and I think that's that's what's the most exciting thing to me, that it's a show that's on Broadway, you know, because of technology, but also so because it's its bones are it could not be more traditional, you know, and that sort of mashup is what is exciting. I and I also just want to say I happen to love musical theater and not everybody does. And if you don't, please leave. Um, <laughs> but it really is like something that I feel expresses so much of what I love. And the thing that blows my mind about Joe Icon is this is such a small thing, but I just have to share it. When you get to the end of I Love Play Rehearsal, which is the greatest anthem for anyone who cares about other human beings, um, the very last moment of that song is it's starting, and we all think she's going to say now, right? Like, that's the whole point of that song is she's getting ready, and she says soon. And things like that are what differentiate Joe Iconis from every other person writing today. It's such a simple thing, and I can choose one million of those, but it's this idea of like you think you know where he's going, and he starts someplace super familiar, but then gradually he takes you on a journey to something that is unexpected. That's a very innocent, sweet moment where he does that, and then there are very dark moments in the play because the human condition is both of those things. Um, Everyone wants to have a friend like Michael, and everyone wants that relationship, and that he puts on stage two men who can freely love each other in high school, two guys, like that's the world we want to live in, where two guys can be bros, but also like have an intimacy and a vulnerability with each other. So I I'm not saying you have to go see this show. I'm just saying you have to go I see am. this show. I um, have to. So George... Yeah. Tell us a little bit about, I thought since you guys play characters in high school now, although you are a few years past that in your life. Yeah, in just your a life. couple. Yeah, but, but close enough that it's raw and real for you. Sure. Um, <laughs> I wanted to know, these are my questions for the time we have together. What would your squip be if you could choose a squip, not maybe to make you popular, but if there was something like that that you could swallow and have something you want? in yeah. your life. But who were you in high school? I was very similar to the character that I play 
um, I just cared so much more about being accepted by everyone. Um, and, but there was like, I, but I, I, I loved my friends and I loved my friends really hard in the same way that Michael loves his friend and loves his friends so hard. But I just cared so much about being accepted and, and, and wanted to be popular. And I, I wanted all those things for myself. And now, you know, it's so interesting. It's like when we think about our high school experience, every th little thing that happens in high school felt so important. Like it felt so life or death. Um, and I think Joe does a great job of capturing that um, urgency and importance in our show. Um, but yeah, I was, um, I was nerdy. I became a theater kid. So I was a nerdy theater kid. I was like um, very overweight um, I was figuring out that I am gay. So that was a, a lot of fun. And I, I also grew up mixed race. So I was having like just constant identity crisis, uh, in high school. I was like, not sure if I was Latino enough or Asian enough or gay enough or, you know, so it was, uh, it was a complicated time for me, but, um, but I, um, uh, I figured it out and I got past it. Um, to answer your question about my squip, it would hands down be Danny DeVito as Frank Reynolds uh, from It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia. And it, not not to take his advice, but in fact to like try to block it out, but also to like laugh at the ridiculous ideas that he would be trying to feed me in my brain. That would be um, a lot of fun, I think. That was so It would so also probably unexpected. drive me crazy. <laughs> Mr. Roland. Oh, uh, uh, my, my, I'm going to start with the squip. My, yeah. my squip uh, uh, would probably be, uh, it, it sort of changes, but um, I think I think my squip uh, today would probably be Jerry Orbach, um, who to me is like the epitome of cool. Um, for those of you who don't have a great frame of reference for Jerry Orbach, he was like on Law and Order for like a million years, but he also had like an incredible career as like a musical theater actor and and film actor. And uh, I just think like he's the 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 coolest like square in the history of the world, which is like who I would want to be. Um, wow. My high school experience, I'm really like uh, lucky to say, was was not at all like Jeremy's experience. Um, a lot of my sort of the lessons, you know, uh, what Jeremy learns in our show is sort of the value of of being himself and and. Uh, you know, sort of uh, stop. He, he sort of learns to not care so much what other people think. Um, my uh, my big challenge in high school was learning how to uh, be kind and empathetic. I was like kind of a bully. Um, I, I might have been mean to George in high school or maybe we would have been best friends. I don't know. No, you probably would have been mean to me. But we still would have been friends. We would have had like one of those, like one of those. And we'd laugh about it years later. Yeah, exactly. But but at the, but we would not laugh about it for a number of years. Um, and I uh, no, I just I I had this moment where like I sort of uh, realized one day I was like, oh, I'm like I'm pretty clever and quick witted. Um, and I would just like you know be sitting somewhere and I would just like say something about you that immediately popped into my head that would make people laugh. And I took n no consideration of how it might hurt your feelings. Um, and that was uh, I was kind of a, a an emotional wrecking ball in that way um, until like I had like a um, I had like an intervention I had like a, a, a mentor who I respected deeply sort of sit me down and be like you know you're being a dick to everyone right and I was like what and she was like no yeah like you're you're very very mean and mean spirited often um, which was like uh, it is a thing that I think sometimes I like I had I had never even thought about like I truly never realized how horrible I was being to people um, which uh, I still sometimes like say the wrong thing, but I'm I'm much more aware of it these days, and I'm and I'm glad to be out of the weeds in that way. But I have worked a little bit of that sort of a little bit of that is is in our story. I think you know a lot of when I talk about the journey that Jeremy goes on, I talk about how he learns to see other people, and he sort of learns that the challenges that he faces are in fact a lot more universal than he ever thought. Um, he starts off kind of kind of self-centered. He thinks like the whole world is out to get him, which is like a incredibly egotistical way to live, um, even if it's sort of self-hating and self-loathing. But we're out of the weeds there, so. <laughs> um, okay, well, I'll start with my squip. Uh, so I, um, I always say it's a tree because I learn all my lessons from nature, but um, I have graduated into choosing a squip that's a person because people have been upset that I keep choosing a tree. Um, and so it's Jada Pinkett Smith because I'm obsessed with Red Table Talk. Me too, I yeah. want someone, I, she is so fierce and she not only knows strength, but she also knows like boundary and joy and like play. She's fabulous and Red Table Talk, if you haven't watched it, it's so good. 
<laughs> this is not a paid advertisement, but it should be. Um, Multi-generational talk show. It's her yes. daughter, her mother, and then they bring other guests and they talk about real things. Really beautiful. It's so, in so really beautiful. really pretty house in Bel Air. Yeah. They have a very, a they record table. in their house because they are the Smith family yeah. and it's cool. Um, so yeah, so I'm a person. I can choose a person. Okay. Um, and then in terms of who I was in high school, I actually think, you know, this show and its trajectory has taught me so much and and the young people who have who have flocked to this show have taught me so much and I always say that I think I've become more Christine Canigula than I've ever been. Um, I remember being in middle school and really wanting to change the world. Like I remember distinctly having that thought and looking at my history book and not seeing myself anywhere and being like, well, don't want to build a railroad um so okay um <laughs> and and not really understanding what that would even mean to change the world um and so when i was in high school i played basketball and <laughs> ah! um and I, and I really resisted being an artist, too, because I, I thought, well, surely that could have no capacity for change, you know? And with this trajectory, and Christine Conigula is so convinced by theater and its power and capacity to change the world and be in conversation with the world. And it wasn't until this show and its following happened and I started to meet these young people and we started getting fan mail and letters about how much this show has impacted their lives and healed them that I really understood that like, wow, what you do and the art that you make in the world actually does have, has great ripple effects that most of us can't even uh, experience or know. But the beautiful thing about social media and also theater particularly is that there feels like a different kind of intimacy than like a TV star because you can go to the stage door and like leave a letter or leave a note, you know? Um, so I feel like doing this show has actually retroactively done so much healing and and strengthening to my high school self and deepening in my present self um, and inspired me, especially with young people in the world right now is like, you know, we were just all taught that we were so much smaller than we actually are. Um, so even being here at Google, it's just so wild. Like there's a cafeteria. I mean, it's just such a, I mean, no, but it really feels like, oh, 2019, even the concept of an office is shifting, right? And there is a different uh, approach to an infrastructure of community. Um, so that's, yeah, but in high school, I just played basketball and <laughs> made out with people. You were, re you were, you were really <laughs> tall I, in high school. I was really tall, and then I shrunk. That's a genetic thing. <laughs> <laughs> the Benjamin Button of musical yeah. theater. Yeah. <laughs> Stephanie's 56 years old. <laughs> Did you expect that this show would be so impactful for young people in the way that it has when you set out? Um, no, you know, I always hoped that the show would connect with with people. You know, when I first wrote it, um, and I wrote it with this amazing uh, collaborator, Joe Trace. Uh, and when we first started writing the show, you know, it was always our intention to write something that felt universal, to write something that that was for people of all ages. You know, it wasn't like, oh, we want to write something specifically for teens, but we wanted to write something that felt truthful to you know the teenage experience. And you know, the, when the show premiered at this uh, initial theater, it, it, you know, it was this little theater in, in New Jersey and a regional theater. And so regional theaters tend to have an audience that's uh, 60 plus, like a, a 60, um, an, an audience in their 60s for a regional theater would be considered young. And so the, that's not even a joke. That's like the truth. Um, and so, you know, the, uh, the first audiences that were really exposed to be more chill were audiences who were decidedly not teenagers. And we always felt like, oh my, like if this show ever had the opportunity to be seen by young people, we really felt like they would connect to it. You know, we felt like it would have an effect on them. And so it's been so gratifying and really mind blowing to see just how many young people have connected to it and how deeply they've connected to it. And you know, it was so funny is like, you know, I, I talked about it a little bit before, but like we wanted, we always wanted to write this show that was about really heavy stuff, right? Like these, these serious issues uh, and then sort of mask it as this, as this, this sci-fi comedy. And initially when we started, you know, showing it to people, older people had a really hard time of getting past the sort of wacky sci-fi-ness of the show uh, to, to sort of get to the heart of what it was about. And young people immediately, 
mm-hmm. got to the heart of what it was about. Like young people immediately were like, oh, I, this is about stuff that I'm going through right now. This is about anxiety and depression. And then the like the crazy sci-fi stuff was like a uh, was came next for young people, and it was so amazing to be like, oh, the the <laughs> the you know the future understands completely what we're doing in a way that the you know their elders took a while to catch on. There's a song that that George, who plays Michael in the show, uh, sings called Michael in the Bathroom, and it basically takes you through a complete nervous breakdown. What happens when you are in a social situation and you are hiding out in the bathroom because you can't deal with all the anxiety that comes with being at a party? And what's fascinating about that song is obviously it's a it's a teen's perspective. But part of why that song in particular also became an anthem for this show is that it doesn't matter how old you are. I literally posted on an Instagram story, me like at a wedding with all these fancy people and then I was singing, you know, Alana in the bathroom (laughs) at this you know very adult thing because I think the reason the show is resonating so well with grown-ups is that we're nothing really changes like this whole idea of guys like us are cool in college it's a decision we make at some point like I'm not going to live with this burden of feeling awkward anymore and it takes sort of an adult moment in our lives to go you know what this is who I am and I'm going to find a community of people that appreciates the things that makes me different I think the thing that has blown my mind and and I'm just going to say quickly will you know was played Jared uh, a character in Dear Evan Hansen that very much seems to me like a perfect uh character for you to play based on who you described yourself as in high school, mm-hmm. right? Jared doesn't quite learn the lessons as elegantly as Jeremy gets to in in Be More Chill. So it's kind of a wonderful graduation just watching my friend in his career mm-hmm. go from a part that uses himself completely and is like a perfect fit and they kind of wrote that character on you as they got to know you. And then in Be More Chill, this character wasn't written specifically for you, but it's like this perfect graduation of the man that you've become by the end of the play. Thanks, Alana. You're welcome. I'm enjoying getting to act too. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, completely. What is really blowing my mind, though, is remembering the Dear Evan Hansen stage door and the Be More Chill stage door is pandemonium, like the number of people who want to get close. And also we're living in a world now, whether it's because of social media or just the glory that is Joe Iconis. Now the creative team behind the show is just as accessible and exciting as the actors. So we're now living in a world where Joe Iconis will get stopped on the street as often as George, Stephanie, and Will, which is just an extraordinary thing that everyone gets their appreciation. But what is worrying me is these shows are so popular because there are so many anxious teens in the world. And that with all of the um, forward motion that we have and like we understand hormones and we understand why teens act, like it, it upsets me that there is still such a need for a show for people to see themselves in. And, I'm, and I wonder what you guys think about that. Yeah. Well, first I want to also say that that something we haven't mentioned yet is that this musical is based off of a book that was written by Ned Vizzini, Be More Chill. Um, And uh, so the root of that too and that um, ennui and that anxiety is also very much um, in Ned's life, but also in the book itself, which is why I think a testament to our show and how it approaches it is that it is a sort of celebration of all the uncertainty and the discomfort as opposed to pulling you back into the feelings of depression and anxiety. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I will say like our show, you know, a lot of people have been like, uh, like why are young people so obsessed with the show? And I've been really processing that recently and thinking to myself like, maybe that's not the right question that we're asking. Why are we not asking why are so many young people and adults really suffering and and hurting? Why are we not asking, why are we not doing better at taking care of our young people, basically? Um, (laughs) That's true, yeah. Yeah. For real, protect trans kids. Protect trans kids. Yeah, I mean that, and so for adults to have that sort of response to a show that is completely expanding young people's hearts and minds and truly providing them medicine, that's a that's a tricky question. And so um, 
in response to what you're saying is like, you know, there are a lot of shows right now, including like TV, like 13 Reasons Why, which is like very controversial on how they depict uh, depression and anxiety. And I think that ennui and sadness and lostness in this time and place in our society that is really thick, it's, it's real. And so instead of like wanting to kind of like bustle our way through it, like let us consider it together and make work that speaks to it that will evolve us into another kind of message that we will be needing to speak in the next chapter, you know? But for us to pretend like this isn't happening and that we're not going through this sadness, especially with young people. I mean, I as an adult am like, looking around this world and being like, I don't even know. I can't even imagine being 17, 16, 12, and being like, whoa, how is my world around me not protecting me, you know? So yeah, it worries me too. And I and I think that what this show does really well is that it, it celebrates that and it gives a place of respite and joy and, and, and energy um that can match the like cyclone inside um your body and tremendous hope and hope right i mean that's and the, promise the yeah. celebration of the show by the end is like everybody feels the way you do the people who seem super comfortable in their bodies there's a great scene in the show <laughs> where where the squip played beautifully by jason tam who's just sexy and gorgeous and smart and talented. he's hot uh go also go see the show for Jason. He's hot. I guess He's that's a hot. shorter, a truncated way to mm -hmm. describe him. Um, there's a minute where he kind of lets Will's character know what all these people are really going through because he can see inside and it's kind of this like psychic ability and it really does allow everyone, even the cool jocks and the people who you know don't have acne, they all have real stuff going on and I think that's been a tremendously successful addition to this musical. For sure. Yeah. For sure. And that's the idea that it's, you know, sort of no matter where we are in our lives or, you know, age, uh, you know, whatever, uh, we've all we've all got stuff. You know, everyone has their own thing going on. And it's just about, you know, figuring out how to deal with it for sure. But that's why it's so fascinating to me that people are still surprised that other people are having a hard time. <laughs> right, right, like, right. Like, are you kidding me? Like, how are you surprised? So... I just wanted, you know, before you sing more, mm -hmm. um, I, the other thing is the show's just hilarious. And the fact that you can take these very deep, dark, real um, situations mm -hmm. and make us mm -hmm. laugh so hard and also just love our neighbor so deep, mm. uh, it's really extraordinary. Joe has worked with almost everyone in this show on Broadway for a long time mm -hmm. in different ways. There's yeah. something called Joe Iconis and family. And just try to imagine that, a group of people getting to go to Broadway together who are friends in real life. And it happened. It happened, yeah. So speak a little bit, before we open it up to the audience, mm -hmm. how you have collected this merry band of geniuses, uh, harnessed that talent and brought it to us on Broadway. For sure, yeah. You know, when I first started out making theater, I just always loved the idea of of having a collaborative um, the community of artists. It always made sense to me. It's like, oh, this is how I want to make make musicals. I want to have a group of people who have a shorthand and who have relationships um, doing it together. You know, when I first started out, I didn't know how I was going to get that, you know, um, but it always seemed like a great way to make art to me. And so, you know, I would do a do a, a concert, right? I would do a show and uh, there would be an actor who I would vibe with and I would just say, hey, I, you know, I, I really like you a lot. Would I you vibe like with you. It's Yeah, I know exactly. Yeah, that, that would be so, so creepy if I literally said that. I vibe with you, actor. Um, <laughs> And I would, you know, and then the next thing I would do, I would ask that actor back. And that's kind of how it started. And so now I find myself with this group of people and it's, you know, actors and singers and writers and directors uh, who I've worked with for, you know, some five, some 10, some, you know, 15 years. Uh, and we call ourselves the family. And it's a very sort of organic thing. And really, it's just a group of people who all have similar ideas about art and theater. And we're all people who are really passionate. You know, we're people who um, just want to make good stuff. 
Uh, and um, my, I, I always say that there's no eye rollers. You know, there's no one in the group who's like, oh, I can't believe I have to go to this thing. Uh, it's the opposite of that. It's people who, if if we weren't doing it on Broadway, we were we would be doing it in a backyard or in a garage somewhere. Uh, yeah. And so now, but the the fact now that we are doing it on Broadway is, I just feel like it's the, I mean, it's the greatest thing. It's always been my dream to have a show on Broadway that I cared about. Uh, and this is that, you know, with all these people who I, who I love, you know, I didn't have to, I didn't have to fire everybody and hire like Hugh Jackman times 10, you know, it's, <laughs> Hugh Jackman's not in the show. He would be great in it. Not this one. Yes, not, not this one, the next one. Just wait till the next one. It's going to be like, yeah. They say the neon lights are bright on Broadway. <laughs> Have you guys found that to be true? We're the only show with a real neon sign. There you yeah. go. Yeah. It's the coolest thing. Oh. Our neon lights are mm -hmm. actually bright. Yeah, Should have Googled it. Yeah, <laughs> Googled it. Didn't know. Um, I wanted to give you guys, if if you are up for it, are there questions from the audience? Uh, Joe, you mentioned earlier that you see the squip as representing the dangers of dangers of technology. But looking at Jeremy's journey, I actually sort of perceive the squip more as the harm that the capitalist and patriarchal society can impose upon us, and Jeremy sort of embraces a more individual and collective synthesis by projecting the squip spoilers. Uh, and I was <laughs> yeah. curious if you could talk to those messages. Can I jump in that one? Yeah. Because I, I just love this thing that Joe Trace talks about. All Maybe mm -hmm. you were going to say this. Uh, Joe Trace talks all the time about um, uh, the squip as the story goes on. It sort of develops these, like, you know, these uh, megalomaniacal world domination plans. Um, and he compares it to, like, one of those chatbots that, like, people get to start, like, spouting, like, fascist and racist things. Um, and I often talk about the squip and its allure as, like, the lure of fascism. Like, this idea that uh, if you behave a certain way and follow a certain set of rules, uh, and ignore your feelings, uh, then you will be fine and everything will be okay and we'll all fall in line. And I think part of what Jeremy learns is the sort of like, he embraces the grayness and the, the complicated nature of the world and masculinity and all, all sorts of stuff for me. What do you want, you want to add to yeah, that? Yeah, yeah, no, I mean, uh, definitely that. And I think that, you know, I, I think that the show, the, the show is not about the evils of technology. You know, I think the show is about our relationship to technology. And I think that um, it's, the, the show sort of stance on it is that it's not that technology is is all good or all bad. It's it's how you use it. You know, uh, it's about how how you're using these um, the these things that are you know um, popping up every day. And it's and yeah, it's this idea that like the script as the script goes on, he's learning more, but he's learning from people. He's learning from the human beings who are behaving in this sort of selfish way. And that that's. That's how, you know, in our story, that's how things get complicated because the squip, who's just a learning computer, has, has learned from the people, you know? And I think it's, that's, the, that's the kernel of it. Um, yeah. It would be, it would be really uh, silly of us if our show was like, technology is bad because it is literally a show that is here because of technology, yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah, like anything, you. right? Like religion is beautiful until you mm -hmm. start deciding yours is better than everybody else's. Yep. So I think there's something... That was such an interesting question. Um, do you have a question? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm super interested in kind of like how you develop a show when you get to the point where you've kind of written it and now you bring all the actors in and you're like, okay, now we're going to put this together and my ideas are wonderful. And then you find out stuff maybe isn't or maybe is. Mm -hmm. uh, what is that process like? Yeah, it's, you? Um, you know, the the process of making a new musical is pretty wild. There's so many people who are involved, right? So it's, you know, it's me as a writer. So it starts with with me. I, you know, I, 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 I work with my collaborator, Joe Trace. And then at a certain point, we're like, OK, we have enough script to involve some actors and a director. And then, uh, and then you know, you get more and more script, and then it's okay. We have a you know enough of a show to involve designers and choreographer and stuff like that. So it's like this crazy thing where you just kind of keep adding more human beings to what starts as a very solitary thing, you know. And for me, I happen to be a writer who's obsessed with actors. I love um, sort of writing around specific actors. So so my process is very. Um, I just want to get in a room with 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 actors so I can hear them perform. The, these parts, and that's when like the sort of phase two of my writing happens. You know, like all of the, the you know these these three people are are like the most incredible actors, and I feel like I would be a fool to not use them in the writing. And so there's stuff that is in Be More Chill that's there because of these human beings. You know, because I want to 
um, you know, use all of the, the the tools in their toolbox and stuff like that. Um, but it's I think it's specific to every uh, to every writer, you know. It's and I uh, and I've I've definitely worked with other writers who are very much like, no, this is what the the script is. I wrote it. That's what needs to be done. Um, and that's just not my my uh, thing. But you definitely learn stuff every step of the way. And then, you know, once you have the show as sort of as as cooked as you're going to get it, then you add the audience, which is like a, a, another collaborator, you know. And so then once the audience starts reacting with the thing, it changes immediately. It's stuff that you thought makes perfect sense is clear that it's like baffling 900 people. Stuff that you thought, you thought um, you know, was not going to go over well is clearly being loved by 900 people. It's really, um, it's, a very, it's a very amazing, uh, unstable and terrifying process. <laughs> if you go online and read more stuff about the show, it's had three major productions so far. Mm -hmm. So they call the one in New Jersey Be More Chill 1.0, then at the Signature Theater off Broadway Be More Chill 2.0, and now it's on Broadway and it's Be More Chill 3.0, and then there will be you know world domination yeah. and it will go on and on and, and yes, will yes. tour. But yeah, I mean, you've had, you know, part of why plays are brought out of town is there's opportunities to tweak, to change, uh, without the New York Times reviewing it and sort of in these safe places to kind of keep working on material. Mm -hmm. um, and then sometimes you can come to Broadway and it really doesn't matter what any reviewers <laughs> say because it's just so good that the people demand that it be The there. people demand it, yeah. Yes, one more question. Hi, uh, thanks so much for coming today. I'm a big fan of the show. Uh, I have a question for Will, oh. uh, because I'm also a big fan of Dear Evan Hansen. Oh, thanks. And I was curious if you could talk a little bit about the transition from Dear Evan Hansen to uh, starring in Be More Chill, and uh, just speak uh, a little bit about any like shared themes or commonalities between the productions. Um, I think, uh, well, you know, for, for me, the biggest transition was that uh, it turns out that my job in Dear Evan Hansen was very, very easy. I didn't really realize it at the time, but like, I was like, oh, I just have to like talk every couple minutes and put on a different short sleeve shirt in between scenes. Um, and now I spend like 90 minutes on stage in a, in a drenched cardigan. Um, and uh, no, but, uh, you know, so, so for me, it was a lot about uh, just like, you know, living a healthier lifestyle so that I could survive this process. That's my, I used to be like, every show I'd be like let's go get a drink and I'd be out like seven nights a week and now I'm like eh, out one night every two weeks um, but in terms of the, the, the similarities between the shows um, I think that they share uh, this this sort of you know they're, they're both uh, on their surface coming of age stories um, you know and I think that that is uh, a, a very a very old story older than Dear Evan Hansen and older than musical theater um, you know the story of a, a young person em embarks on a journey to learn about themselves um, and and, and what is exciting about both of these shows is that they really center on a very contemporary experience, um, which is, I think, a lot of why they've resonated with young people especially, because it's a, it's a really, like, universal like issue we all have where we we just have these you know these voices these doubts these constant sort of barrages of of feelings of inadequacy um but the thing that i love so much is what makes them different which is that Jeremy hansen takes this this very earnest very naturalistic very you play in a living room approach to looking at these issues um and uh and and that is very effective in its own way and the, the thing that i love about be more chill is that it takes this sort of zany subversive sci-fi approach to everything and and what that does i think is disarm audiences in a way. Um, you sort of go in being like, ah, this poster's pink and his head's dissolving. Like, oh, this play is going to be fun. Um, and then you and you sit down and it is fun. Um, but then when it gets to the sort of the serious meat and potatoes of the, the themes of the story, uh, you are sort of primed in a different way and it works on you in a way that I think sort of, uh, I think when you go into a play ready to be sad, you put your guards up a little bit. Um, and when you go in a play ready to be joyous, you sort of open up in a way and you receive the content in a way that just sort of lives deeper. And I, and I, I see the way that Be More Chill ripples out and the way that people carry it through their lives. And, you know, I, I did uh, nearly a thousand performances of Dear Evan Hansen. And I can like count on both hands the amount of times that I saw people in costume or, you know, people who had really invested a lot of post-show time back into the show. Um, whereas Be More Chill per capita, the engagement, as we say in the, in the, in the tech biz, the engagement is much higher. Um, you know, the way in which people are reflecting the content back at us is way higher than what we saw at Dear Evan Hansen. I think that has to do with the way that the show works on people. 
Um, and so I feel like I, I got to make like a huge upgrade in terms of my own personal sort of values on art and how it can work on people. So uh, just so you know, as an aside, there's a podcast called How to Be More Chill, where you can hear really in-depth conversations with all of the cast and creatives beyond what we can do today. And I highly recommend it because it is really a deep dive into the person behind the part and then what makes the creation of this particular musical so special. So if you want more of these people, which of course we do, um, that's a way to get more uh, in the privacy of your own home, car, or subway. Um, <laughs> I cannot thank you guys enough. There's never enough time because there really are so many levels to this show and the people who make it that makes it one of the most unique gifts uh, on Broadway. And, and I thank you for that. There is also a whole other level of this show which has to do with familial tensions and relationships. There's a father at the center of this play also. Uh, played by an actor named Jason Sweet Tooth Williams, who isn't here today. But it is also a love story between a father and son dealing with loss outside of what's going on in their high school experience. And Mr. Joe Iconis is going to grace us with singing the song and kind of closing out this event today. So first of all, thank you all for being here and sharing this time with us. Thank you guys for being remarkable in every way. Did I not say you would not just fall in love with their talent, but their hearts? <laughs> Cheer if you agree with me that they are magnificent Woo! people. Thanks, guys. Anyway, Mr. Joe Iconis, and then we will be saying goodbye when he's done singing. Um, so this is, uh, this is a song that in the show is, is sung by Mr. Here, Jeremy's dad. And um, there it is. Uh, and Jeremy's dad, you know, as uh, we, we sort of talked about, he's this adult character. He's uh, one of the major adult characters in the show. And, um, you know, in the show, the, uh, one of the things that we spend a lot of time on is this idea that everyone is suffering. Everyone's going through their stuff. Uh, and so we obviously spend the most amount of our time with these young people. But this song occurs in Act Two, and it's sort of like a glimpse into what's going on with Jeremy's dad's, uh, dad's life. And the thing that you need to uh, know is that Jeremy's father, uh, he's, he's suffering from depression himself, and he's gone through the entire show uh, without wearing pants. He's been unable to put pants on. So it's a performance that's uh, exclusively done in, uh, in tidy whities and a robe. Uh, and that's, that's what you need to know. Thank you for having me at Ask Jeeves. <laughs> is in big bad trouble right now and he's ashamed of me apparently so i gotta help him somehow and i don't know what he wants but i know what he needs he'll need a dad so strong to help him not slip away i haven't been a dad for so long but I think I'm ready today. The situation is great. Hey, hey, now's the time to be brave. Hey, hey, I'm gonna finally make that climb one leg at a time. When you love somebody, you put your pants on for them. When you love somebody, you take a chance just for them, chance just for them. If the road gets muddy, you focus on the goal till the rough stuff's gone. When you love somebody, you put your pants on. I need you, cause I do not have the tools to help with what he's going through. And I know you know all the rules And I'm not what he wants But I'm just what he needs And this might be hard, I know But you suck it up and go When you love somebody You put your pants on for them when you love somebody, you take a stance just for them, stance just for them. If the fight gets bloody, you just keep pushing through till the rough stuff's gone. When you love somebody, you put your pants on.
When you love somebody, you put your pants on for them. Wear those pants metaphorically. Or sometimes actual pants, real literal pants. It's a classic study of the things we do for our best friend. When you love somebody, you see it to the end. When you love somebody, the conclusion's forgone. When you love somebody, you put your big boy pants right on. You put your pants on. Thanks.